Today we are talking to Michael West, uh, professor at Lancaster School of Management, Lancaster University. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for taking the time. Uh, you've got your degrees from the Welsh universities where you, where you are from, the universities of Swansea and Cardiff. You did your PhD at Cardiff, and you also worked in the Welsh coal mines mm -hmm. during your PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, you became a professor of uh, psychology at the University of Sheffield, then you moved to Aston Business School in 1998, that's yeah. where we met and partly yeah. overlapped and, and worked together. Uh, for the last six or seven years you were dean of Aston yeah. Business School and recently you moved to Lancaster yeah. University. You have uh, published numerous books on teamwork, cooperation, innovation and creativity. You published hundreds of articles and book chapters. Mm. You are a fellow of almost all societies <laughs> and associations in our area. Uh, but you also, and probably that's the most important achievement, you have impact in the real world with your studies on the national Mm. Health Service in Great Britain, uh, you're consulting secretaries of health or Downing Street and, and other officials. Uh, today we are interested not so much in your scientific or academic insights in leadership research, but about your personal experiences. Mm. First question is, is, is quite simple. Do you think leadership is important? Do we need it? Or are people like you good examples for how people can self-organize, self-motivate? My sense is that we, we, we do need to have leadership, but our conceptions of it, I think, need to be a little bit more sophisticated. If you go back to um, where we were on the savannah 150,000 years ago and you know to survive you need to catch an antelope in order you can feed your 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 group of people <clears throat> and to catch an antelope on the savannah is a very complicated exercise you know it it requires that um, you know you you know which animal you're going to pursue and who's going to play what roles and if if you lose the animal mid hunt then you need to shift your focus of attention and that requires leadership you know somebody who will coordinate somebody who will uh, enable people to communicate some pe somebody who will get people to clarify their roles and so I think it's inevitable that we look for leadership um, in situations which are complex or challenging uh, and, and that's very true in, in modern life and I think in many ways becoming more true than ever. I think where we make a mistake is when we think that leadership is somehow and you know it's a heroic figure it's somebody who's charismatic it's somebody who is different from the rest of the crowd that actually in a way we need everybody in organizations everybody in society to take responsibility for leadership that we all need to be leaders at particular points in time so you know you know from some of the work in social psychology around bystander intervention that what we have there is you know people see an incident and because there are lots of other people around nobody nobody takes uh, action nobody takes responsibility so i think there's something for me about uh, changing our conceptions of leadership so that everybody understands their individual responsibilities in society uh, to take to take on leadership in difficult and compli complicated situations. So if we all can be leaders in some situations, how yeah. do you then characterize effective leadership? Mm. Do you think there's an overarching theme that makes mm. people effective? Yeah, I, well, I, I think that... Um, for me, effective leaders are, are first of all um, people who have a positive vision of the difference that you know they want to make in the world, whether it's um, in their communities or in an organisation or whatever. Uh, it's people who I think you know they're effective if they are positive and optimistic and confident about pursuing that vision. Because if they're not positive and optimistic and confident, then the people around them surely will not be. Um, I think it's also uh, people who uh, are concerned about about good relationships, so influencing people through being positive with them, through establishing cooperative relationships, cooperative ways of working, through coaching people, through giving people feedback on their performance, through encouraging people, through nurturing people. Uh, and, and that's also about 
you know, for me, effective leadership is about working in teams. And, you know, you described my career accomplishments and uh, I feel that those accomplishments aren't mine. They are genuinely uh, many people's accomplishments, and I've been fortunate enough to have my name on, on, on so many, on so many of those accomplishments. But actually, they're the result of the work of many, many people. So I think leadership is about working with, building, uh, and being part of of, of teams. Um, I think it's also increasingly effective leadership is about reaching out across boundaries. So working with people from different disciplines, working with people from different organizations, particularly working with people from different nations and different cultures and different ideologies and different religions, uh, I think is really now, in, in our world now, vital for effective leadership. And, and I think effective leaders are people who are, you know, fundamentally kind, you know, who, who are kind in their orientation to other human beings because I, I think that we create effective communities in the long term through building trust and kindness. Um, and, and I think effective leaders are also people who are courageous, people who will have the courage to pursue a vision, the courage to be kind, <coughs> the courage to reach out across boundaries, uh, and the courage to innovate. None of whom I've met but I would list people like Aung San Suu Kyi uh, in, in uh, Myanmar who has, in a very quiet way, been an inspiring leader to not just people in, in Myanmar, but people all over the world. The Dalai Lama, again, not a, not a, 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 a dominant, loud, extrovert sort of figure, um, but, but someone who, through uh, wisdom and, uh, and gentleness and learning, has had a profound influence. Nelson Mandela, whose, I think, his leadership was extraordinary when he was released from Robben Island. In a way, what he did was to go against his followers, you know. At that time, and I think it was, you know, for all of us who were aware of political events then, we anticipated that South Africa was about to embark on uh, the most bloody, awful civil war. And uh, the ANC, the African National Congress, was ready for Nelson Mandela to lead the ANC against the apartheid regime. But he went against his followers and said, you know, we must negotiate our way, if we possibly can, to a new state, to a new democracy and a new freedom. And he had the courage to do that. And, and so, for me, it's leaders like that who particularly inspired me, and most of them have been people of humility and people of uh, kindness and people of gentleness uh, and, and people who've been prepared to be persistent over a long period of time to achieve the vision that they aspire to. For me, the, you, you talked about my role as the Executive Dean of the Business School, and for me that was an opportunity to try to put into practice the learning that I've derived from psychology, particularly over the years, about what constitutes leadership and what constitutes a, an effective culture within an organization. So that was an amazing privilege to, you know, almost to say, well, here's a laboratory of an organization of 200 people with a turnover of 50 million euro. You know, let's see what happens when you put this into practice. And for me, that was about making sure that there was a clear vision for the organization, that, that we had clear objectives at every level, that the management team had clear objectives, that uh, the departments, the teams, the individuals all had clear aligned objectives about what we were uh, seeking to achieve, making sure that there was a, a climate within which people felt valued and respected and supported, where we did a lot of appreciation, awards, you know, for being in innovative or inspirational. Um, and, it, and I think if you're giving lots of positive feedback to people, it's very easy to give negative feedback. However, there are some sorts of behaviors that um, are so um, contrary to the values and norms of the organization that if they are tolerated, then they undermine the culture. And, and I think the mistake that we make in many organizations is we don't deal with the really bad behavior um, in, a, in an effective way, particularly when it's from senior staff. But my view has always been that when there is bad behavior, that it is dealt with swiftly and immediately and decisively. And if the individual does, won't change that behavior, then they have to leave the organization. If you're not going to contribute to the community, 
community, if you're going to undermine the community through being aggressive, dishonest, abusive, then there is no place for you in the community ultimately. I think we need to give people clear direction, we need to have clear direction uh, in organisations and a big part of that is listening to what it is people in the organisation want to achieve, what the organisation wants to achieve. So the role of leader is to spend a lot of time listening, learning from the people he or she leads and then helping to craft or sculpt a direction which both meets you know the kind of environmental demands that are out there and and reflects the values of the people within the organization i think what we also need to do is to uh, is is to ensure there are good relationships within organizations you know in other words people are professional they work together well they get on there's good humor you, know, you talked about the coal mine uh, which is a dreadful environment, but for me what made it very manageable was the amazing humour and wit and fun that people had underground, as well as really, really looking after each other. Why are so many people ill, burnt out, absenteeism is, is a big problem in, in the UK and in Germany? What, why is that? Yeah, well, I, I, I think the reason is because we, you know, we don't put the principles into operation and I think it's a challenge for us as, as researchers and, and as uh, organizational scholars to try to understand why is it that given all the knowledge we have about what makes for an effective organization managers, leaders are not actually doing that in practice uh, and, and it seems to me there, there are probably a number of reasons. One is a sort of cultural legacy that you know for the last hundred years um, we've had an we've had the legacy of if you like the old historical industrial context where command and control was the way that you got things done in mass production and the way you got things done in in uh, in heavy industries um, which were male dominated anyway uh, and and you know we have to somehow let go of that cultural legacy and begin to recognize that that's not an effective way of ensuring productivity and profitability and the well-being of people as you've indicated well I, you know what I've done in in my work life is um, in a sense taken our research out into organizations and talked with people as much as possible about how we can create the kind of organizations that that you and I know are much more effective and and what I've found remarkable is that when I talk in organizations people get it mm -hmm. you know they intuitively get it they know that that's the way we need to go uh, and I think the onus is on us as people who work in the discipline to keep taking that message out there to try to engage with senior policy makers with government officials with the leaders of organizations and with people at the front line of organizations not just sharing with them our knowledge about what makes for effective work organizations and, and effective communities and effective leadership but uh, it, picking up on some of the questions you asked me showing them the simple steps that can be taken to, to bring that about so that it doesn't feel like some unattainable nirvana that it is a practical reality we can create so I think I think there's a big responsibility for us and that's why I think centers like your center for leadership and behavior in organizations can do an enormous amount of good both by deepening in our, our knowledge of what makes for effective leadership and effective organizations but also translating that uh, for people who work within those organizations and showing them the steps that we can take to build more effective human communities at work. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks. Pleasure.